It's Leviticus 23, verse 33 to 44. The Feast of Shelters. And the Lord said to Moses, Give the following instruction to the people of Israel. Begin celebrating the festival of shelters on the 15th day of the appointed month, five days after the Day of Atonement. This festival is to the Lord will last for seven days. On the first day of the festival, you must proclaim an official day for holy assembly where you do no ordinary work. For seven days, you must present special gifts to the Lord. The eighth day is another day, holy day on which you present your special gifts to the Lord. This will be a solemn occasion and no ordinary work will be done on that day. These are the Lord's appointed festivals Celebrate them each year as official days for holy assembly by presenting special gifts to the Lord, burnt offerings, grain offerings, sacrifices, and liquid offerings, each on its proper day. These festivals must be observed in addition to the Lord's regular Sabbath days, and the offerings are in addition to your personal gifts, the offerings you give to fulfill your vows, and the volunteer offerings you present to the Lord. Remember, that the seventh-day festival to the Lord, the festival of shelters, begins on the 15th day of the appointed month. After you have harvested all the produce of the land, the first day and the eighth day of the festival will be days of complete rest. On the first day, gather branches from magnificent trees, palm fronds, boughs from leafy trees, and willows that, that grow by the streams. Then celebrate with joy before the Lord your God for seven days. You must observe these festivals to the Lord for seven days every year. This is a permanent law for you, and it must be observed in the appointed month, from generation to generation. For seven days, you must live outside in little shelters. All native-born Israelites must live in shelters. This will remind each new generation of Israelites that I made their ancestors live in shelters when I rescued them from the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So Moses gave the Israelites these instructions regarding the annual festival of the Lord. So I want to start this morning with a, a question, and uh, it's kind of a simple question, and that is, do you ever feel like your relationship is less than it could be? not a rhetorical. Put your hand up if it's you. And, and, and it doesn't matter what kind of relationship. Maybe it's the relationship with your spouse, right? Less than it could be. Maybe it's relationship at work or a family member or a friend. We look for, you know, fulfillment in all of these uh, relationships that we have. And sometimes when we feel like it's less than it could be, maybe it feels like we're walking around dry. Like it's not fulfilling the way that we what happened in the pandemic is I think a lot of people woke up to the fact that they were going through the motions of life, of, of daily activity. They were doing things, but it was leaving them dry. Now, I'm, I'm in the business world every day, and so what happened in the pandemic was something called the Great Resignation. Google it if you want. But people were leaving their jobs in droves for other jobs that they found life in, that they found joy in, that they found more money in, or that they just wanted something different. And, but it woke them up to this idea that perhaps we're just going through the motions and we've been on autopilot for so long, we've actually not taken time to examine what's really going on. The pandemic also woke up some other things that revealed stuff in people's hearts. Drug use went up. Suicide went up. Divorces went up. So did babies. So, you know. I think more important than the pandemic and what that exposed for people going through is that inside the church, we're going through an epidemic. We're going through an epidemic because people are walking around in a dry relationship that could be vibrant and wonderful and incredible and we are settling for less than what God has for us. We're going through the motions. We're settling for cheap substitutions on what God has. 
and it's an epidemic. One of my favorite authors, um, he's a, 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 originally a Jewish theologian in the early 20th century. His name is Abraham Joshua Heschel. And he wrote this that's going to be on the screen for you. He says, man is a messenger who forgot the message. You and I have been designed to carry a message from the Almighty. And if you're new here, first of all, let me say, hi, I'm Pastor Todd. I'm not Ronnie. You're welcome. Or I'm sorry, however you want to say that. But I want you to know if you're here, what we believe and what we actually believe is that you can know God intimately. The Hebrew word for know there is the word yada. Everybody say it because I don't know if you're awake. Yada doesn't mean know about. It means know personally, know closely, know physically, know intimately. We don't just settle for, for, for doctrine or theology or knowing about God, but we can actually know God personally. And we get the gift of the Holy Spirit in us and on us, and we get this beautiful, hot mess of a community called the church. And so I want you to feel free to wrestle with the big questions of faith and following Jesus. But just know that what we believe is that you are actually a messenger with a message, and that that God knows you. He has a plan for you. He has a hope for you. It's a bright future, and we can walk in that. Amen? It's good. All right, y'all got to wake up because 9 o'clock crushing you right now. So if you're just joining in, we're in a series called Trumpets to Tabernacles. It is following the fall feast as written out in the Old Testament where the people of God learn these sacred rhythms. And, um, and so their, their fall feast, these feasts are holy days, sacred times, convocations, depending on your, your, your translation. They were for the ancient Israelites, and they're followed along even until today. And each of them was celebrating something that God was doing in the people, and it opens up opportunity for what God is asking God's people to do now and respond to now. In other words, these feasts, these holy days, these festivals, they set a rhythm that forces us to create space for God to move in our lives. And so this series, which we will continue to revisit, we did it last year, doing it again this year, we might do it again next year and the year after, who knows? We'll continue to do it, is begging us to ask questions about God, about ourselves, about our world, and our roles in it. Pray with me for a second. Heavenly Father, over the next few moments, we ask that we would be hearers and doers of your word. We ask that you would open up hearts, that you would shine light into the dark places, that you would uh, create um, transformation in us. Meet us here and don't leave us here. Amen. So this week, uh, I have the honor of talking about Sukkot. Everybody say Sukkot. Depending on your translation, it might look like this, S-U-K-K-O-T. Some have a S-U-C-C-O-T-H. It is not suck. Okay? Uh, but it might look like it. And, uh, and so Sukkot is the festival of booths or tabernacles or temporary shelters. And God we're celebrating is that God comes and lives with the people, lives with the Israelites, and lives with us. And that scripture that we had read over us by Maddie from Leviticus is easy to start passing over when you're reading through Leviticus, because I'm not the only one who just went, yep, mm -hmm. something happened, there was a day, it was a holy convocation, they did some things, there was some stuff. I don't understand what they're saying. There was some days and months. Can you just say October? What is the seventh month? What does that even mean? I don't know when the Day of Atonement. So thank you for pointing out it's after this day when I don't know when that day was. And so we just kind of glaze over this. And yet in the midst of this beautiful passage of Scripture, God says this feast is a permanent thing to do for all time. Why? What's really going on underneath the surface 
of this seven-day festival and this holy convocation, eighth day, where there's another event that happens at the end of it. Um, I, uh, I want to give you some history and some context here. Rather than drive, going through and teaching and, and going line by line, I'm going to get to preaching this morning. Is that okay? Okay. Well, let's, let's get some context first. Let's get some history. The people of God, uh, the Israelites, were in slavery in Egypt for like 400 years. And God, with his prophet Moses, shows up on the scene and miraculously leads them out of Egypt and out of slavery. In fact, there's an exodus, hence the book Exodus. And the Red Sea gets parted. There's movies about it. They don't do it justice. My favorite is the, um, you know, the cartoon one where they're like swimming in the sea. Anyway, okay, movies about it don't do it justice. And they walk through the Red Sea and they go into the wilderness on the way to this promised land that God has for them. And the land is a good land, full of flowing of milk and honey, and it's a place where God has true life set up for them. And in the wilderness, in between those two places, is where this moment, where God's physical presence comes and sits with them. So they're in the wilderness, and, and, and God says to Moses, Hey, I want you to make a big tent, the tent of meeting. And inside the tent, make a holy place for me, and I'll put my presence, the Ark of the Covenant, in that holy place, okay? And so they make this tent, and you can read all about it. It's got poles, and it's decorated funny, and and all this. But they make this tent, and God asks to be in the center of the encampment of the people. That says something in and of itself. We got asked to put that tent there, and then um, they're all living in tents. And he says, I see you. I'm with you. There are moments where the presence of God becomes so real, they said that a pillar of fire and smoke would represent God's presence in the tent. And so this festival is celebrating that no matter what wilderness we are going through, no matter how temporary and how challenging our situation is, that God is fully present in that moment, in the midst of that. And the tent was a precursor to the temple, which was a a permanent structure built. And so they finally make it into the promised land, and they build this temple, and, and, and so they're celebrating this festival, it takes on certain evolutions to remind them of the moments that God is actually present with the people. Only as it always happens, things can't be left well enough alone. And the Israelites, like so many of us today, started to get dry. They forgot that they were a people with a message from the messenger. They stopped being God's agency and representatives in the world, and it says that they rebelled as God's messengers. And eventually what happened is they were taken as slaves into exile. And so they went from slavery, freed into God's land, and then back into slavery. It's in that foreign land in Babylon that the evolution of this festival takes on new heights and new meaning. And so they start making these shelters in the side of their homes and in their yards and outside the city of Babylon, and, and, and they started some new practices because they were celebrating God's presence and providence, and it was a historical reminder of how God is with us even in our darkest hours. They were trying to remember that they were actually God's people. As they started creating space for this, it started working in people's hearts and minds, and it it sent some people to go reclaim that land. And they rebuild the land, and then they come back, and they they rebuild the temple, and they're, they're trying again to be God's people. And then there's a period in between the Old and New Testament where they feel like God is silent. Like maybe God isn't present anymore. And it's in that season where the next evolution of this festival takes place. Because I think in our lives there are always times where we 
we think God is silent. Maybe he doesn't move when it's not happening. And so they doubled down. And they, they, they built shelters and they, they started new practices. In fact, it, it culminated in this practice where the, the high priest would daily take from the pool of Siloam, which is this pool at the bottom of the city, um, where when the waters were stirred, people would jump in and they would be physically healed. It had healing properties because of God's presence. And they would take these jars of water and they would make their way up the temple mount and pour it into the silver basin on the the altar, which is, you know, the altar beside the bread of God's presence. And, and they would fill the water up in this basin. And on the eighth day, the culminating event of the whole festival, they would pour over that basin and the water would flow off the altar and onto the floor and out the doors and, and into the streets and back down the city because it represented God's living water flowing and healing the world. And so today, some people have this practice of even camping now. You can be one of the crazies. Some people create symbolic shelters and tents and space. It's taken on evolutions and there's, there's a lot of meanings behind all the things, but today what I want to do is I want to look at just four of the many reasons why the feasts matter and its impact. Everybody tracking? Okay. Number one reason why the feast matters is it cultivates space for God to create. We have to, if we're going to really celebrate this feast correctly, we have to cultivate space for God to create. Perhaps one of the reasons why the church is in an epidemic, why people are, are trying to follow Jesus powerless and dry, is because we haven't cultivated space for God. My, my wife, uh, a little while ago, got on this kick of wanting to garden for our family and, and, and grow healthy fruits and vegetables and um, I said there was a store for that, and she said, I've got seeds. And I said, okay, that sounds fun. And so she went full sixth grade, and she got the egg cartons out. You guys know what I'm talking about, the egg cartons. And she filled it with the dirt, and she stuck the little seeds in the dirt, and she put the egg carton by the window, and she watered it. And some of them kind of you know, started to grow, and some of them didn't. And none of them really took roots. So then she got on the old interwebs, and she says, i got to figure out how to do this for real. And she got all these tips and tricks on how – to go from an inhospitable environment to a real healthy environment. And she got this um, uh, heated blanket, and she put it down on this table. And so it controlled the temperature from underneath. And she got deeper egg cartons that were some kind of special biodegradable egg cartons. I don't even know what they're called. And, and so it held more dirt, and she put the seeds in. And then she had a, a watering schedule. And then she bought some lights that helped subsidize the light from outside. And and, and they started to root, and they started to grow, and then she would take that egg carton and put it in a bigger bigger bowl of dirt. And that bigger bowl of dirt would grow something bigger, and the, the thing would dissolve somehow. I don't know, it's magic, okay? And, and then those things ended up on my porch, and my porch looked like we walked into some sort of Home Depot garden section, and we had watermelons growing, and we had peppers growing, and it was all over the place. She didn't create it. She didn't make it grow. She created an environment where God did something incredible. And what we have to do is we become horticulturists. We have to create an environment. We have to cultivate a space where God can create something in us and through us as a people, as a person, as a church, as, a, as, as audacity. That's what we have to do. And if not, we're just creating inhospitable environments. I think one of the reasons why the people of God, once they, they got freedom from slavery and they got into that promised land, they were doing those things. And then they went back into slavery. He, hear what God says through the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 4. For thus says the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem. That's inclusive if you're worried about gender. It's all the people, okay? Break up your fallow ground and sow not among thorns. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord. 
Remove the foreskins of your hearts, O men of Judah, inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my wrath go forth like fire and burn with none to quench it break, uh, because of your evil deeds. Maybe you guys are smarter than me, but this, this verse starts up with this command of break up your fallow ground. I didn't know what fallow meant, so I googled it and looked at dictionary.com. It turns out fallow means untended to, left, hard pan. In other words, God is saying, break up your hard pan existence. I am looking to change your heart. So maybe we need a different space. Maybe we need a different routine. Maybe we need space for ourselves to be ex- like examining our hearts. And that's kind of what the festival does. See, what they would do is nightly, they would create these giant bonfires. And every family would put a torch in the bonfire. And then they would parade around the city like a full festival parade of lights. And they were in silence, by the way. And they would be walking around praying and asking God what dark spaces in them needs to be lit up with God's presence. And the next day, as the bonfire was going down, they would throw other leaves and things on it to create a giant smoke and be asking the prayer, God, what do you need to smoke out? See, God doesn't force himself. uh, He doesn't force himself on us. He doesn't force us to do something. We get invited to create an environment. There's a building in Owasso um, that, uh, that someone bought and boarded up with a sign that said, coming soon, and it sat there for five years. Coming soon, five years with boards. Waiting. Someone bought it to restore it. It had all the drawings. It had all the plans. But they had none of the permits. And you and I control the permits for God to break us up and restore us and rebuild us. We ourselves are the only thing keeping us from God's best. So if we're going to cultivate space, how do we do that? Some of this may seem obvious, but you have to pray. Imagine that. You have to actually talk. Perhaps you need more Bible reading. Believe it or not, if God's going to speak, He's going to speak loudest through these words. Maybe you need to be a part of a community that's going to hold you accountable and spur you on. Maybe you need something like fasting, or maybe you need to take it deeper. You need to get in the rhythm of Sabbath where you actually sit in silence or go on prayer retreats, or maybe you start serving missionally to the people around you. For whatever it is, we have to cultivate that space because God's not going to himself in there. He wants to be invited. I have a warning. The second half of this passage, I I find it really cool because one, it says circumcise yourselves to the Lord and and, and, and remove part of your heart to expose your heart. But then it ends with, hey, my wrath is going to go forth like fire and burn with nothing to quench it. Like meaning there's no end. It's just going to consume everything because of your evil deeds. Good news. Maybe you're sitting there, and the first time I, I, I read that, second time, I, I didn't catch it. Like, I don't have evil deeds here, God. I'm not like, I'm not, I'm not out there murdering people. I'm not, you know, I'm not a purposeful liar, you know, like all the things that I'm not. So here's the warning. You know how you get fallow ground? You do nothing. You didn't have to wake up and purposely say, you know what, I'm going to wreck this land. And all you had to do was stop working on it, and it becomes totally uninhabitable and unusable. And all we have to do is stop doing something, and the evil deeds are going to be there. The thorns are going to be there. The ground is going to get rocky and hard. The building's going to break down. You name it. So what in this festival season, what rituals, what space do you have to have or cultivate for God to begin to move in your heart, and in your life, in our church, city? Number one, we have to cultivate space for God to create. Number two, 
Intimacy comes even in our vulnerability. You know, one of the reasons why I think people are dry is because we still operate from this terrible place where thinking we have to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. The reason why we don't go deeper in relationship is because we're worried about what might happen, so we got to put it all together, and then it's just a show, and it's just emotions, and there's nothing real there. But if we want trust, if we want intimacy, do you know what actually drives that? It's vulnerability. Not only do you get the aha and the me too and, and, and all of those things to talk about like, hey, I'm not alone in this. I, I actually started to ask this question, God, you know everything, right? And there's plenty of Christians that, that do this. I don't need to, God knows. You're right, God does know. And yet he still asked for you and me to tell him about it. Why? So that we admit to ourselves we're not doing it by ourselves. It's imagine that caked into how God wants to operate is what's in our best interest. That's how good God is. He asked us to share so that we admit to ourselves. In the corporate environment, they have this thing, they call it cross-fixing, right? And it's a set of meetings that you design to go between teams. So if you have a big organization and you have somebody that's leading the various teams, they do a weekly meeting, and it's a short meeting. It's like 10 minutes, 12 minutes. And what they do is they tell every department, shares what they're facing, what they're struggling, what they're trying to achieve, and what their goals are. And in the midst of that, what happens is when you realize, oh, they're not going to hit that deadline, they have this problem, some other team that has other resources or extra people or extra time, they step in and solve the other group's problems. It builds teamwork, it builds intimacy, it builds an organization that thrives. You know what that does in our relationships? It does the same thing. That's why I love praying together. When I pray with my wife, I get to hear her heart in ways that I never hear in any other space. When we are praying, our hearts are, are exposed and vulnerable, and we actually get to become the answer to each other's prayers. I think that's how intimacy works. When we're vulnerable, God prompts in that praying time, I'm saying, hey, I have this struggle, I have this challenge, we, we're facing this thing, and yet God prompts the other person that's praying with us to say, you can solve that. Here's a creative answer. It's cross-fixing. Intimacy builds this. And when we celebrate Sukkot, we're celebrating God's presence, not being distant, but being in the trenches praying Hear this from Exodus 33, which is part of the moment where the tent of meeting gets created, okay? It says, Moses entered the tent, and the pillar of cloud would descend. This is the pillar of smoke and fire. Would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent, and the Lord would speak with Moses. And when all the people saw the pillar of the cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would rise up and worship, each at his tent door. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. I imagine it was like this. Hey, God. Hey, Moses. What's going on? Sucking at life today. Um, Struggling to have enough money at the end of the month. We really don't know where we're going. We're directionally challenged. And probably God would say, you know what, man, I've been there too. Here, I've got some ideas for you. You know why? Because that's how I speak to my friends. I go, hey, man, that totally sucks. Have you tried this? Do you think he's speaking with God face to face as a man would with his friend, and God wants to speak to you and me that way, but we haven't created the space for that to happen. We haven't been vulnerable enough for that to happen. You know what's really cool? All the people that saw God's presence stood at their tent doorway rejoicing. Why? Because sometimes when I can't hear God, but I know you're hearing God, your story becomes my story, and it encourages me because I know God is still good and still faithful and still speaking and still working. So in the waiting, in the dark, in the in-between, in the already and in the not yet, My vulnerability, man. 
Okay, a couple of things about this passage. That pillar that steps down in there. When it moved, the people of God packed up the tent and the whole assembly, we're talking like a million people, moved with it. We have something to learn about that because here's what happens. You and I, we make our plans. Say, hey, I'm going to marry that person. I'm going to date that person. I'm going to take this job. I'm going to do this thing. And then we say, hey, God, would you bless my relationship? Would you enter into this relationship that I didn't consult you on first? Would you bless this job that I just took that I took because I wanted it but didn't ask you about it first? And we ask God to move after we've made a decision rather than seeking God's direction and saying, hey, you're moving. I'm going too. I have a joke. If Holly ever leaves me, I'm going with her. Why? I know she won't ever leave me, but that's not the point. The point is we're together, and when God moves, I'm going with him. Why? I love all y'all, but I don't love you like I love him. And I don't want to invite him to the plans I've already made. I want to consult him and follow his plans. But when I think I have to do it, and I have to prove it, and I have to work it, What happens is I start doing my own life my own way, and I'm not focused on God's presence, and I'm not rejoicing. When somebody else is speaking to God, I'm saying, God, why aren't you moving on my behalf? And he's saying, I moved, and you didn't go with me, bro. Okay, I gave you a warning about fallow ground, saying if you do nothing, it goes back to being fallow. I'm going to give you a warning here. Psychologically, we we have a problem. Humanity, humans, us. Homo sapiens. But I said that wrong. It doesn't matter. Our brains trick us in the worst way. Neuroscientists can show you that 85% overlap here. 85% of the same neurons, pathways firing when we talk about, talk about it versus actually doing it. And so we can trick ourselves saying, I talk about God, I talk about the things of God, and we're not actually doing the things of God. And so we avoid intimacy and the hard, and we trick ourselves and say, I went through the motions, I talked about it, I'm good. And you may not even be intending to, because your brain has played a trick on you to say that you've already achieved something that you just talking about. First thing, we have to cultivate so God can create. Secondly, intimacy comes in our vulnerability. Third thing, praise and rejoicing puts things into perspective. Praise and rejoicing puts things into perspective. Sukkot is a play on words with the Hebrew word for harvest. And it's celebrated in harvest not just because it's in the fall, but because we are celebrating that we are feasting on God's presence and God's providence. And if we don't do that, what happens is what we focus on becomes our reality. And so the problem that I face becomes all-consuming, and it becomes the thing, and now God is nowhere to be found. But I'm not focused on God, am I? I'm focused on the problem. So perhaps you're sitting here and you're, you're waiting on the promise of God, just like the people of God were waiting in the promised land. I want you to know, or waiting for the promised land, but I want you to know part of their wilderness experience could have been completely avoided. God had a, a promised land flowing uh, uh, with milk and honey and, and, and life planned for them, And they got right up to the border of that promised land. And they sent spies in to check it out so they could devise a plan for how they were going to enter in. And 10 of the spies came back and said, hey, this place, we can't go there. It's filled with giants. It's got all these problems. There's no way we're going to do that. Which begs the question, whose voice are you listening to? Two of the spies came back, Joshua and Caleb, and said, we got this. God's plan for us. And you know what they listened to? They listened to the problems instead of following Christ, and they ended up in the wilderness for another 40 years. Now, God used those 40 years, and he redeemed a lot of that, and and, and the people of God took on the identity 
as God's people, and they learned what it meant to be ruled and governed and, 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 and all of those things, but they lost an entire generation because they didn't put things in proper perspective. And I wonder if part of what this Sukkot festival is about is really about praising and rejoicing so that we can put our lives in proper perspective. One of the things I know is true is that God won't give us something that we don't have space for. And plenty of us are asking things from God when our garage and our homes and our lives are so jam-packed and so busy and so full of other things. We're saying, God, I need more. And he's saying, you ain't got room for that, buddy. Hosea. God says through the prophet Hosea, and he's working on this beautiful relationship, trying to restore it. It says this. It's not in your notes. It says, I said, God's saying, plant the seed, good seeds of righteousness and you will harvest a crop of love. Plow up the hard ground of your hearts for now is the time to seek the Lord that he may come and shower righteousness upon you. When we leave, with rejoicing. Even though we're not already there, even though we haven't fully yet become, we are affirming the goodness of God and our faith. We, we praise before the breakthrough, and Sukkot is the time that we remember where God is with us every step. So we plow up the ground of our hearts. What I love about this passage is not only will we harvest a crop of love, which sounds really intriguing, but that God showers his righteousness upon us. And perhaps we haven't created space because we're not leading with praise and rejoicing. We're leading with our problems. Cultivate space for God to create. Intimacy comes in our vulnerability. Praise and rejoicing puts things in perspective. And the fourth point for us this morning is that God is using your situation so you point to salvation. Whatever situation you find yourself in, God is using your situation so that we can point people to salvation. I have a question. This is not rhetorical. Hands up. How many of us are waiting, are in a situation, need a miracle, need, need, need addiction beaten back, need a cycle of sin broken, need a relationship restored. How many of us are in a situation that is dark? If you're not, you will be at some point. So we may as well put our hands up. We need it. The rhythm and season of Sukkot, of the tabernacle, of of God's presence with us, perhaps the reason why it's a permanent festival to be celebrated for all time is because God is in the habit of coming near in, in the flesh, physically entering into our situation, and we can easily forget that. By the way, that's the gospel. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. Check out this story from Mark chapter 1, starting in verse 40. It says this. A leper came to him, imploring him, and kneeling, said to him, said to Jesus, if you will, you can make me clean. If you will, you can make me clean. And moved with pity, he stretched out his hand, and everybody say this out loud. What did he do? He touched him. And he said to him, I will be clean. He touched him. I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him, and he was made clean. And and Jesus said to him, hey, hey, go don't say anything to anyone. Go show yourself to the priest and, 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 and offer you know, to the priest what you need for, for the cleansing that Moses commanded as a proof to them. Because in that environment, you weren't allowed to be around people if you had leprosy until you went through the proper protocol. And the priest said you were clean and could go back into society. 
And he didn't do that. <laughs> he went out and began to talk freely about it, spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town, but was out in desolate places and people were coming from every quarter. Now, I love this passage because Jesus touches this man and he asked for faith and obedience and the gospel is spread. It can't help but being spread. Right? But the man didn't obey. And although people came to Jesus from every quarter for healing and restoration, I wonder how much more ministry, how many more people would know the good news of the gospel if he had been obedient. God wants to use your situation to point to salvation. So if you think you're beyond hope, just picture God touching that situation physically. If you will, he says, I will be clean. But I'm going to ask you to go and do something so that the people around your situation can know that I'm the one who did this and give glory back to me and they might come to know me and be healed as well. God has you right where you are. He is present in your situation. But God has you in other people's situations to be his hands and his feet. And so we rejoice because God is using our situation to show salvation that he is with us. So this morning, I, I, I want to end with this question. What do you need to plow up? What space do you need to make? Where do you need to circumcise your heart? Where are you waiting on God? I don't want to just talk about it, right? Because then I can trick myself into believing that my theology is going to save me, or my doctrine is going to save me, or how righteous and pious I am is going to save me. I don't, I don't want to neglected and become hard pan where God's not using me and I'm not seeing the presence of God. I don't want to be defined by the problems that I see. I want to get perspective. So where do you need to be plowed up in your heart? What space do you need to make? What dark places does light need to be invited into? We praise to get perspective. We rejoice to open ourselves up even in the hard because God's promises are for us and our praise always comes before our breakthrough. So I want to invite you to stand. We're going to sing a song right now called Praise Before My Breakthrough. And maybe you came in this morning and you're like, talking about camping. Every time I have been camping, even though I don't love sleeping on the floor and somehow being cold and sweaty at the same time inside of a sleeping bag, every time I've been, the people that I'm around to, around with, I always be closer. Every time. Sukkot is the season where we live in these tents so that we can have that sort of intimacy with God. And so this morning, I, I, I ask you, I implore you, rejoice before you get there and allow God's perspective to change things. Allow God's presence to, to touch that situation and point other people to salvation.